is there a whiskey show that once COVID restrictions have been lifted that you're looking forward to most to going? I know that you've been to Glasgow whiskey show. Um, I've heard there's some phenomenal pours there. Is there one that uh, is your favorite that you want to go back to as soon as you can? No. <laughs> Are you done with whiskey shows? Yes. Hey, welcome to Super Social Club. I'm Jeremy. This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Welcome to the Whiskey Ramp Podcast. It's a little crusty. It's frustrating. And it's going to be a little bit of a rant. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Some sort of injustice. Anyway, and rant. Hello and welcome back to the Whiskey Ramp Podcast. I'm Jeremy. I'm Rob. And today we are super honored, humbled, and privileged to have oh, so Ralphie welcome. on the channel. Ralphie, so thank you so much for doing this podcast. You're very welcome, Malt Mates. Happy to be here, and um, and and thank you for that very flattering introduction. I was squirming a wee bit there because I, I'm I'm not very good with compliments, but it's very kind of you anyway. So I'll I'll accept them gracefully. Well, the Whiskey Ramp podcast is so fitting for you to be on it, just because you are the original Whiskey Rant person. Like you can't go a couple episodes on your channel without a little sprinkle of a rant here and there. So it's super fitting to, uh, to have you on for sure. Yeah. To say we were inspired by you when starting this podcast is an understatement for sure. Yeah. Oh, bless. I tell you, the thing about a wee rant is it helps warm up the whiskey. <laughs> Indeed. And yeah, we have the uh, Aaron in front of us tonight. Uh, this is our value whiskey. Um, Ralphie's got the Bit of the core range there. Rob's got the 18 and 21. I've got the 18. Um, great stuff. Um, for our rant topic tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the evolution of whiskey, kind of where it's going as far as price and value is concerned. Rob and I uh, into whiskey relatively uh, for a short period of time. We've seen some whiskeys go up in price and quality go down. Uh, Ralphie with a much longer uh, window, um, lots of experience, obviously uh, his insight to where he's seen whiskey go as far as quality and price ratio um, uh, far exceeds ours. So it'd be interesting to get his opinion on that for sure. Um, we've seen it with McAllen, I think Rob, like as far as where McCown has gone recently uh, with their pricing increases, their quality. Uh, Ralphie, what can you speak to as far as what you've seen, uh, not necessarily McCown, but any distillery that you've definitely noticed a increase in price, decrease in quality? Right, Joe. Um, well, you did mention McCallan, and it's a bit of a it's a bit more complex than all that because McAllen still produce some basic entry level designed for drinking whiskies, which are accessibly priced compared to say back in the 1990s. You know, prices for the standard contemporary drinking whiskies, they haven't actually changed that much, but it depends where you are in the world because of tariffs, taxation, the cut that the distributors and importers will take. And then also at the other end at the retailers, if they see a particular whiskey selling well or becoming fashionable and popular, they will, it's, it's understandable, they're running a business and they will feel very tempted to pop an extra 10, 15, $20 onto the top end in the shop because they know that people are going to pay for it. But it's not as simple and straightforward as it appears. If it was to pick out uh, an official bottling at the moment, which I feel is disappointingly bottled and not delivering in relation to the price, I would select nothing personal, but it would be Royal Brackler, mm -hmm. because the standard range of Royal Brackler, nice fancy bottle, but they're bottled at 40%, which is a legal minimum. But with Royal Brackley, you know, I, I, I'm getting to the stage, it's not even with Scotch whiskey, I'm looking at rums. And when I see a rum at a higher than 40% strength, I'm automatically thinking it's a better quality presentation, which it is. So I'm much more tempted to buy it 
particularly if it's accompanied by an age statement, because however you want to kind of interpret that, it's something tangible to go on. It's much more identifiable. Strength alcohol, volume in the bottle, 70 centiliters or 75 centiliters, whatever. These are fixed, definitive points of reference for standards. So is an age statement. But it's when you have vague, particularly overdressed bottlings, where they're, where, they're, where they're using superlatives like the finest of casks and slumbering peacefully, silently in our uh, bespoke warehouses over the years as the dust settles and the angels waft up and down getting their share and everything's lovely and gorgeous. Basically, that's flannel. It's, it's not so much this makes a huge difference. It's all the little differences that add up, um, which if, if we were novices, if we were occasionally buying one or two bottles of whiskey a year for birthday presents or for burn supper or New Year, whatever, or for Canada Day, you know, you, you, you're not going to even give a second thought to that. You're going to be quite entertained and it's going to psychologically set you up to have a better experience of the product when you're reading the, the blurb on the box on the back of the label. But when you're an experienced whiskey drinker of whatever spirit you're into, you start to find that over time, because you're developing your own palate and everybody's palate develops inevitably over time, you just start to find it a little bit patronizing Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when it becomes more and more fanciful, fanciful the, the psychological effect is it's almost as if they're my, misdirecting you away from the intrinsic quality of smell and taste, which ultimately is what we're damn well paying for. Absolutely. It's Actually, what that... the pounds, euros and bucks down. That's what we're looking for, the smell and the taste, because it's what we are homing into. And I think that the industry reluctantly, now some folk in the industry are totally with it, they totally get it, but the, the liquor industry, not even the Scotch whiskey industry, but the liquor industry generally is very traditional, and that can be for the wrong reasons as well as the right reasons. True. And it's interesting how they say we're sticking with tradition, we do things the traditional way and all the rest of it. Meanwhile, the latest... Um, cost-saving innovation that they can find, they will jump at it. And you see that in particular in cooperages with the highly, um, the high amount of investment in automation of the refurbishment, construction, and use, pre-use of casks. Uh, it's simply a sign of the times. But as we, we all get more experienced with uh, liquor, and I'm not just talking about Scotch whiskey because it applies to everything. Um, we, we start to lose patience mm -hmm. with the disingenuous side of presentation. When you have a huge volume output, you certainly need the consistency of supply of casks. And therefore, it does make sense to have a highly automated industrial form of getting your casks prepared and it will certainly save you a lot of money because a fully qualified and trained and experienced cooper um, is, is worth at the moment in the UK about £45,000 a year. That's the, what they can command in a salary. Um, some are getting more um, and, and this being in, in Canadian dollars, that's about what fifty five thousand Canadian dollars. It's way more than that. That's almost well, like seventy five thousand or so. Yeah, it's almost double. It's a little bit short of double. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's good. That is good earnings, by the way. Absolutely. And I think that it's considering the repetitive nature of the job and the small skills that are requiring, not just to create a a standard 200 liter ex, ex, American white oak bourbon cask, but to do larger casks and smaller casks, particularly smaller casks, they can actually be more challenging for the cooper to work with because they've get less wriggle room with the pliability in the, of the wood. Um, but it's your small 
cooperages with the quality that they can, they can focus on quality and sourcing good quality oak. There are so many, many varieties, even within American oak itself, Queris Alba, depending on the location, on the altitude that the trees are growing, on the type of soil that the trees are growing in. Um, and there are certain areas in the US which have a reputation of just basically being a much better source of American oak than others. And it's the small cooperages that do things by hand who are going to source the better quality because that justifies their extra premium and helps make up the difference in profit that they lose because they're doing things more manually and more bespoke. But it's an interesting thing to note that small American distilleries are latching on to the fact that by paying the extra premium for a best quality, not just a good quality American cask, but a best quality American cask produced by the likes of, for example, the Adirondack Cooperage in New York State. And there's about two or three, four around the US who, who produce to that quality. Um, that turns their decent whiskey or bourbon or whatever they're producing into prize winning and award winning because there is so much, not just flavor in the wood, but depending on the caliber of the cask, its ability to provide the form required, the environment required for longer term maturation is significantly different from a rough and ready cobble cask. That's a great point, actually. I think that's interesting that you mentioned that because unlike Europe, the United States probably takes up what a dozen European countries in, in, in geographic size. So you're getting all kinds of different climate. You're almost better off not calling them American Oak and calling them Californian Oak or New York Oak or Florida Oak or, or whatever, because it doesn't, Absolutely. they're not the same. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's something that distilleries in the U S are yet to feature and should be featuring is when they source their wood for their casks from a specific um, state, they should mention it, they should feature it, because it's reinforcing the message that what they're producing is quite literally homegrown. Yeah. And that's important now. Absolutely. That actually um, kind of touches on my next question for you. Uh, transparency has always been a big thing for you early on when you started uh, Ralphie Reviews. Now it's Ralphie.com. You've, you've really cared and really sent the message, which I think all YouTubers or whiskey tubers in particular moving forward kind of took that on their back as well and said, hey, transparency is a very important thing. And I think many people didn't think about that before they watched the Ralphie Review. And then because of you, all the other reviews that came to follow. But is there any company that's maybe... Um, a, a company that you've decided not to review from their ex various expressions just because of their lack of transparency? Not a single one. Um, everybody gets a shout. And, and when I choose a whiskey, when I'm out online, because I'm doing my research online um, and buying primarily online as well, what I'm looking for is is this good enough to score in my marks and the malt marks over an 80 out of 100? Because I know I'm getting income from Google AdSense and from my Patreon subscribers. So it gives me a budget to go out and buy. And when I'm buying the whiskey, it allows me to be a lot more wriggle room and, and just being honest and just giving a frank opinion because inevitably, if a distillery is to give you something, you know, they're not asking for anything in return, but there is an informal contract. There is a, for, a sort of moral contract. And I think it's something one has to be wary of. And right from the beginning, probably because I was a, a compulsive whiskey buyer and I was never putting money in the bank because I don't trust banks. So I was buying whiskey because whiskey is always good collateral anyway. So... 
um, I, I would basically say, you know, is this is this is this a better whiskey? And I tell you, nothing, nothing motivates you to buy better whiskey than after you've bought a disappointing bottle, particularly when you've overpaid for it. It is the best lesson you can learn in negative returns. And what you want to do over time and experience, and this is the great thing about the internet, is by looking at various hubs, ports and channels and various, um, having your personal contacts and Twitter and Zoom and all the rest of it, you get consensus. And the consensus helps you to steer away from the bad buys and to be the first to discover something that's appeared in the horizon that other folk maybe haven't particularly latched on to yet. Yeah. But- well, I think we have a couple follow-up questions to that. I know Robbie might have one. I have one as well. And I guess it's why not review a whiskey that you would score below 80? Why not tell your audience, you know, this is one that I don't like and here's the reasons why. And if you see it on the shelf, you know, this is my opinion. You could stay away from it. Why not review those whiskeys? You know, it, it would be it could almost go viral if I sat in the bothy and absolutely tore apart an inferior malt or sing or, or blend. It would be hugely entertaining. It would be a super run, and sometimes it's tempting to do. But it's always been my policy from the word go that I want to keep things in the positive and not go to the dark side. <laughs> um, I tend to more or less avoid reviewing blended whiskies now. And I want to put it in this context to my spoiled malt palate with the fact that I can go out with the budget I have provided by online activity and I am spoiled for choice with all the good single malts that I can buy. What right have I to put a shitty review of some basic blend that someone out there wants to buy and they're sipping it and they're just mixing it and it's what their budget's for and then they get basically the malt snob tearing the blend apart and telling them how shit it is when to them because they're not drinking much in the way of whiskey it's an occasional treat and they're probably mixing it with soda or coke or whatever or, or, you know, turning it into a, a long cocktail. You know, it's, it's, it would be entertaining, but I don't think it would be positive. And I'd rather keep things in the positive. And it's probably one reason why I've gone 11 years with a, uh, a lawyer's letter. Do <laughs> you think that scoring whiskey out of a hundred scale is kind of a disadvantage in the fact that someone, if they score a whiskey, a seven out of 10, all right, well, that's a decent score. You know, it's a decent whiskey, but suddenly you score it 70 out of 100, and now this is the worst whiskey I've ever reviewed on my channel. Yeah, it's because people want, the scores are important, whether it be one star to five star, one to 10, or one to 100, or whatever the way the system you choose, people want an immediate point of instinctive reference as to the actual whole, whole, holistic quality of what you're reviewing beyond your descriptors of smell and taste and form. Yeah, I think people want to know, okay, well, do you like it more than this one or more than this one? And they check your score. Okay, this one score is more than that. And that's your opinion. I think a lot of people go into a liquor store. I think that's why, you know, um, reviews do so well when you do an entire core range is like okay i got money for one of these bottles which one would you recommend and suddenly Mm -hmm. you can check all the scores like okay this is the one that they prefer you know it might be the 10 year old is they like it more than the 12 year old and that's the one to go for um so yeah so yeah interesting scoring whiskey on a larger scale sometimes uh, at the detriment um because a seven out of ten a three out of five you know, that's a pretty solid score. You, you know, put that out to a scale of a hundred and suddenly it doesn't look so good. Yeah. I got a lot of slack uh, for marking on a alphabetic uh, scale early on on my channel. Um, being a teacher by trade, I felt that it was fitting because it was, it wasn't uh, as committed <laughs> when you give something an A as opposed to 
let's say a 90 or 91 or, you know, uh, the letter grades weren't as fi like final, I guess you can say, because for me, I don't know about you, but um, for me, whiskeys tend to change over time. And well, we know that we know that you feel that way, but uh, the mark for me definitely changes over time. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I, I'll score something in 90 and then a year later, I'll feel like it's maybe more like an 88 or, you know. That's a fair point. But what people want is your opinion at that moment in time of the review. Um, that they will find for themselves how their whiskey changes for them over time and whether they think it gets worse or gets better. Now, whiskeys usually get better for a very simple reason. It's got nothing to do with the whiskey. It's to do with the increased seasoning of the personal palate, taste in particular rather than smell, that happens as the mind as the brain gets more frequent references over time to that same whiskey it starts to translate it more articulately and therefore this is why I'm not that coupled with a certain amount of oxidization which softens liquor and brings out its greater subtleties and also it tends to um make the, 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 for the sensations in whiskey a little bit more articulate, sweet, salt, sour, savory, and bitter. They become more prominent, partly because they're becoming more transparent in the liquor due to oxidization, but also because the palate, through personal experience with that specific bottle over time, is simply becoming more heightened, more aware, and more articulate. You know, and I, to add to that question, actually, it's something that I've been uh, probably most recently because, like you said, we get the Patreon support, we get the we get the AdSense support. Um, it's something that I've been contemplating recently because I know that you don't accept bottles from various distilleries and you don't accept bottles from um, ambassadors and 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 the such. So I've been definitely conflicted with this um, as of recent because the channel is seeing a little bit of success in the last year or so. Um, early on, I had a, a very tough time not accepting these things because um, it was very expensive to keep the channel going, especially where we live geographically, um, finding new spirits to review on a regular basis. Uh, gets really, really expensive in Ontario uh, specifically. But um, I guess what I'm go getting to is um, maybe you can explain to these guys why you don't accept them because my whole, based on your philosophy there, uh, I don't like, I, I tell my um, people in advance, if you're going to send me something, be prepared for me not to review it because it scores lower than an 80 percent um so i try to keep honest with them but also honest with my viewer uh, as far as my scoring and i found that because i have accepted things in the past i'm probably not giving the whiskey that i'm accepting a fair shake uh because i'm overly critical of it and and i think for that reason i'm gonna probably moving forward stop accepting things but this is something that I can do being five years into the game, whereas maybe somebody new to the game is going to have a lot of trouble with because of how expensive things are. So maybe you can explain your stance on it. Absolutely. It's a bit of a tightrope to begin with until you get established. It is very tempting. It's not just the free bottles, which appear to be free, but they're, they are in, they're, 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 they're proxy gifts. There is an understanding that there's a contract with the gift. Um, and if you don't follow up on it, you won't get anything else. And, and fair dues for those that want to go down that road. It's very cheap advertising for the producers, because bear in mind, advertising a page in a spirits magazine, a whiskey magazine, is very expensive. You're looking at, for a, just off the top of my head, and this is approximation, a full colour ad in a European whiskey magazine will cost you between four and five thousand pounds, which is 
78,000 Canadian dollars. Yep. So particularly for the inexperienced onliner who's got a bit of an audience, it's very tempting for the distiller to build up a rapport, a rapport, tell you how fantastic your channel is and send a bottle your way and you're very, very grateful and you feel special. And then it's followed up with an invite to the launch, the event, where, you know, and we'll have these really old whiskies and you're going to get a double portion and all the rest of it. <laughs> it is a honey trap. Yeah. My perspective is, and I've been, I've been fortunate and right at the beginning, um, I had loads of whiskey, so I never had to accept anything because it was already there. Um, but it's the piper that calls the tune. Who pays the piper, sorry, who pays the piper calls the tune? And who pays me to play the pipes, the malt pipes, is the YouTube Google AdSense, is my Patreon subscribers, and is the revenue from selling my book. Now, all that together gives me a decent budget, not for really old whiskies, but there's no point in reviewing really old whiskies because too few people can afford them and buy them. You're far better and it's far more exciting to go treasure hunting amongst the much younger whiskies, particular from uh, independent bottlers and from less known official bottlers like Glen Cadam, for example, Classic example, a, month, a number of folk who have gone out and for a, not a lot of money, the quality of what you're getting in return is fantastic. Absolutely. You recently read Ralphie's book. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the one question, I guess, that I have about your book, which is a great book, by the way, lots of interesting <laughs> stories. And I want to touch on some key points, which I think that our viewers might uh, like um, and might want to purchase the book because of it. Um, but one thing that I wanted to mention, and it kind of relates to our rant topic about changes and prices over time, uh, the whiskey boom, and you kind of seeing that in perspective, is you have a small little blurb here in your book about sourcing out 30-year-old uh, first edition Baroras. And I don't know if you remember what you paid for those at the time. I, um, I recently bought a Brora and it cost uh, 2,200 Canadian dollars. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that I overpaid for it. I think it's an exceptional bottle of whiskey and I'm glad I have it. Um, but do you remember what you paid for that? And if you look at price of Brora now, how they've just completely gone through the roof. Right. Back in... <laughs> 1990 something or just shortly after 2000s it gets a little bit hazy over time with liquor um, <laughs> but I was walking down a street summertime west end of Glasgow and there was basically a fairly standard tobacconist, tobacconist newsagent's liquor store um, just literally embedded in the wall and in the front window the shelf was literally buckling under the weight because it was chipwood of these plain black cardboard boxes with cream labels and little silver fringes called rare malt selection and this was probably the second run from Diageo, who had basically taken on the role of in-house independent bottler of their own official bottlings. Yeah. And at this point, the flora and fauna range, which was also around, was the, the younger whiskies. And they had a kind of showcase, including off Rusk and uh, Rosebank, a superb Rosebank 12-year-old. And I was aware of them and had been buying a few particularly the Rosebank, because there's so few other options, even amongst the independent bottlers. Um, this was literally really before the, the... The internet was there, but it wasn't doing much, so you didn't have the online points of reference. So I went in and inquired about the price, and they had Port Ellen, Brora, Rosebank, Linkwood, you know, 
the who's who of desirable older whiskies. Kulil, another great 23 year old, superb. And um, it was 85 pounds a bottle, which translates into about 160 Canadian dollars. So I think at the end, I bought about 24 of those bottles. <laughs> As I say, I was earning, I was earning the money. I was modest. I wasn't spending much on anything else. I mean, I'd kept the same car for about 13 years. Um, and I wasn't keeping any money in the bank. So I was just buying whiskey and stashing it up. And I opened some of these bottles. I've opened the Brora. And my opinion, and this is an opinion, the rare malt selection brewers tend to be more pity than independent bottling brewers because brewer is in fact quite a chameleon malt. In my opinion, and it is my opinion, the reason that there's pittiness in the rare malt selection brewer is partly to do with the fact that they were matured in ex lagavulin casks. Now, mm -hmm. I was told this, I don't know for sure, but the person telling me was in the industry. Having said that, you've got to be careful what you believe. Absolutely. But it's, it was inevitable over time. There's always got to be the totem malts, the ones that are the easy, the lazy bones go to for superb um, investable grade whiskies. And that's why McAllen is still at the top of the heap, followed by Kuruazawa, because it's got that. But you have these other collectible whiskies, which are more known, not so much to industrial collectors, but to seasoned whiskey drinkers, like Port Ellen, like Northport, like Glen Oogie, like Brora, and like these vague halfway house Kleinlishes, which are either Brora or Kleinlish, but someone's forgotten in the system. Because <laughs> bear in mind, Brora and Kleinlish are essentially one distillery divided into two halves. What, quick, real quick, what's your thought on Brora opening back up soon? Good luck to them. Um, it's very telling that they shut it down in the first place back in the 1980s. But it was a very different landscape. You see, in, in, in the whole whiskey industry now, there's not that many people left who remember those times. And the, the, to any spirits industry around the world, it's all about boom and bust. You have your dizzying heights of prosperity and demand and prices, and then suddenly it implodes. I actually have um, a question that's also happening in whiskey too. Um, something that perhaps 11 years ago, you probably didn't think would happen, but whiskey tube, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the term. Roy uses it a lot. A, a lot of the um, YouTubers have been coining this phrase as whiskey tube because when you started, there may have been one other, if that, uh, two, maybe three uh, whiskey reviewers on YouTube. Um, now there's hundreds. <laughs> um, yeah. 11 years ago, did you anticipate a movie on the silver screen coming out featuring Ralphie Mitchell himself? <laughs> a movie, right, is... is is this one that's already been made? So this one, this one features you and it's, um, it's, I think it's coming out today, uh, today or yesterday. I can't remember the exact date, but, uh, the water of life. Water of uh, life. Yeah. Um, I really didn't anticipate anything. I just basically took it as a come, but I was approached by the, uh, producers of the, the film who, who wanted really, an outsider, someone less predictable <clears throat> to be in their documentary or docudrama, whatever category it's in. And I was quite happy to go along with the experience. Um, I mean, I, I very, very briefly appear talking about probably the previous owners of Bruch Laddie, who were Jim Beam Brands. 
uh, not particularly caring for the place, which was pretty self-evident and true. Um, but I have a very, very, very small part in it. And it's, it's a nice little thing to be part of, but it's not, frankly, it's not my bread and but It's not that important. I mean, it's this kind of show busy type thing to me is pretty much irrelevant. Um, well, that just I goes to show your humility, uh, Ralphie, because I mean, a lot of people, every, obviously you're, you're, you're very well respected and the, the, you're, you're a trailblazer also in the industry because guys like Jeremy and I would not exist if it wasn't for you. So to see uh, the OG uh, of whiskey reviewing on YouTube appear on, in a movie, I think that's a big deal for, it was a big deal for me personally. And, and um, I was one of the lucky ones that got to preview a water of life, which is a great movie, by the way, I, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, but to see you there, and to know where you came from, I thought that was that was an aha mo moment for me because of the impact that you've had on the whiskey industry. And it's not just on YouTube. It's it's far exceeded that, which I think is really cool. Well, thanks very much for the compliment. But I wouldn't say I've had much of an impact at all in anything, um, much less. I mean, the industry does its own thing. I would say, actually, I'm more of a nuisance than anything. Um, and a kind of mild irritation to be tolerated because there's no doubt about, about it that my activity online, along with many, many others, sells a shed load of whiskey and all other spirits. Uh, let's not be naive about this. That's what the industry is really concerned about. And if we weren't doing so, we, we'd be we'd be well off the radar. I mean, we we like to romanticise whiskey, and we have our own little kind of cosy zones about it. But at the end of the day, it's a business like any others, and they need to turn a profit. And I think the industry um, tolerates us because we're saving them a fortune a serious large amount of money in very expensive traditional advertising, which is no longer really reaching the market because people have, have transferred online. Distilleries themselves have attempted to have their own channels with very mixed results because they tend to be too traditional and too conservative about it. And I think that they realise that the likes of yourselves and like Whiskey Tribe and Roy and all the commentators and many commentators, as I refer to onliners, are now at the stage they're doing a far better job than I am in terms of presentation because they're doing the editing and the, the lighting's far better. I mean, I'm just sitting in the, in the, in the mouldy old bothy, uh, just basically tackling a new bottle every week, which I, I must say, I'm not complaining. It's a very nice place to be, but I do have to kind of ease off and kind of dry, have, have a few dry days um, frequently just to keep, keep, things, um, keep things relatively sober. And, and to be honest, more objective, because see when you've been reviewing whiskies for a number of years, you can actually get develop palate fatigue um, and I know that the professionals say master blenders in the industry, when they're off duty, they, they can't even bear to smell a whiskey. Uh, they want a gin and tonic. They want a break, and I don't blame them. Well, lots of interesting stuff came out of your first book, and it's a great first book. Um, a couple takeaways that I think that, you know, our audience might be interested in. It's just these like, stories and relationships uh, that you talk about. There was one... Um, uh, a gentleman that you met at a bar. I think his name was Sani. Sani. Who... Yeah. So he sold you some samples. And some of these samples that you mentioned in the book it just sound absolutely outstanding to me. Um, a cast strength 1972 Macallan, 
uh, a 1941 Highland Park. Do you remember drinking those at the time? Yes, I do. Um, I'm trying to make sense of them because these were very, very complex whiskies. I'm sure. Um, and they'd been drawn samples which had then been discarded. Or I mean, this is the old days. So these things happened. Um, and of course, when they were drawing samples, they would be drawing them straight from the casks. And the first, first point of arrival of any cask in a warehouse is the cooperage where they're going to check it, open it up, um, and off, basically offload it from the delivery lorry. So th this was basically a cardboard box and it had a number of bottles, small bottles in it, with pencil writing on it. Mm. And naturally, for most folk, they're completely uninterested in this. It wasn't a tangible bottle of whiskey like Bell's or Famous Grouse. It was just some labelled sample that nobody was particularly interested in, but I was. I have to say that um, at that particular stage, my palate wasn't, I was a slow learner, so my palate, well, palate wasn't that well developed. I enjoyed them, but I didn't really make a lot of sense of them. Right. Um, I, I, I wasn't mature enough in my palate to know what the the to what to look for and look out for in a really old whiskey, um, it, it was certainly an experience. And in fact, I talk about Sani again. He features in a story in the second book um, because the rumor had it that he came to. Um, an unnatural end. Right. That there was a suspicion. It was pub talk mm. that, in fact, he was bumped off. Wow. But I cover that in a fictional, I've got to say this, it's a fictional story. I've got to say this to cover my ass here in case of comeback. <laughs> right. Um, but these things happened. I mean, he was a cantankerous old bampot, but... And to be honest, he was a bit of an arsehole. Right. <laughs> but he spoke to me, and I was in the pub. Nobody else was showing an interest. Mm -hmm. Folk would get a tumbler of whiskey, take a glug, oh, that's lovely. Um, and then they'd get back to their lager or whatever. But for, for people who work in the industry to see someone actually properly taking an, an inarticulate moment to smell and, and give feedback in what they're smelling. That wasn't normal. This was way back in the 1980s, the late 1980s. And bear in mind, it was in 1983 was when an awful lot of distilleries were closed, some of them permanently, because there'd been a huge downturn in interest in whiskey because it was just considered an old man's drink and boring. Sunny yeah. was... He was one of many characters. You get, you still find them. Go, go to a distillery. As soon as you walk in the gate, it could be the cleaner that walks out or someone that's just, you know, rolling barrels. You know, everybody's got a story to tell. And one of the secrets of visiting a distillery is it's not just chatting to your tour guide. They will be very informative. It's chatting to other people at the distillery that don't are not saying much. Hmm. That's when you can really learn a lot particularly the people that are sweeping up, they know everything that's going on. Sure. Yeah, they're the, they're the fly on the wall, right? Yeah. Um, we, we definitely need to make a Super Social Club Whiskey in the Six trip to we Scotland. Will be doing that. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah. One more thing I wanted to mention in the book, um, the little, little like uh, timbit that you had in there, was using your Ralphie charm at a whiskey show to get a special tasting of a whiskey that I don't think was released yet, or maybe was just released, um, Arbeg Ugadel. And do you remember sipping that Arbeg for the very first time? And how is it different than Arbeg Ugadel bottled today? Right, Joe. It is different. Inevitably, it's different. Um, it was one of the early whiskey live festivals that was organized in association 
with the whiskey industry. And it was an expensive affair for exhibitors. It wasn't until the independent whiskey festivals like um, Whiskey Fringe in Edinburgh, which was organised primarily by Royal Mile Whiskies, came along that whiskey festivals really started to take off in Scotland. So the Whiskey Live Festival was quite a state affair. There wasn't that many folk exhibiting, and what they were exhibiting was standing, tending to be standard stuff. But Ardbeg had just been bought over by Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, LVMH. Um, and they, they, they knew they had a good solid brand. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, Mark Rennie from Bruch Laddie, when he went over to buy Bruch Laddie Distillery, it wasn't actually his first choice. He went over to try and buy Ardbeg. Not a lot of many people. Not a lot of many. Not many people seem to know this, um, but he certainly, as he was very forward-looking as a specialist wine retailer, he could see the potential. He was a very. He's still very good at reading ahead of the curve, so to speak. And I wish him every success with his new distillery in Ireland. It's certainly hitting the ground running, but at the same time, I think some of his whiskies are still too young. But hey, he's got to get the money in to keep the business going. So good luck to him. Um, but um, I went up to the table and there was definitely an attitude behind it. They, they brought in non-industry people who were there to be presentation models. Yep. So they couldn't say much about the whiskey, but they were very charming. I just turned on the charm. So they gave me a good whack of Ugadal. It was it was very, very good. You will find at auctions, people are wanting to identify earlier bottlings, which they perceive to be in better casks. Mm -hmm. One of the skills of the contemporary whiskey industry, where it is now, because it's all very well yearning for the, oh, the good old casks in the old days when whiskey was better. No, it wasn't. It was different not necessarily better, somewhere there was more lucky casks around because there was simply a lot fewer people buying whiskey. Hmm. So these casks were available, which are not generally available now. But one of the great skills, and I think Aaron are very good at this because they have the experience in their team to do it, is they don't make the mistake of trying to keep the continuity of flavour as they go from batch to batch bottling, they focus more on the continuity of quality, which mean a slight adjustment and variation in flavour. And I think all distilleries are subject to this challenge. I think Aaron do it very well because they, 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 they have a number of weapons in their arsenal to achieve this. And one of them is by using older whiskey at a younger age. So you can make up a batch of 18 year old Aaron, but if they decide to put some 20 year old in, so be it, because it will give it a little lift. So they may not have the absolute continuity of specific flavor, but they have the continuity of quality. And they already know because they're active online that people are picking up on this and it's a topic for Anorak's conversations. Absolutely. I, I, I totally agree. And I think um, another company that I've another distillery that I find does a really good job of this. And I've only recently discovered it because trying their core range wouldn't exactly um, tell you that they're doing this. But Glenn Farkless is finding these family casks that tend to be, in my opinion, some of the best cherry casks you can find like in present day some 15, 16, 17 year old family cast that just blow me away uh, compared to other companies that are coming out with, or other distilleries again, uh, coming out with uh, 30 year old um, casks. So, uh, I mean, I think that's a lot to do with, like you said, trying to focus on quality as opposed to continuity. I think there's a specific reason for this Rob, and it's to do with the fact that Glenn Farkless is a family 100% family-owned business, owned um, by George Grant, who's the current 
proprietor of that distillery. And he has long-term relationships with owners of Spanish bodegas and has that singularity of reach to source these casks. Sure, it's a challenge. And people are understanding and accepting that it is very rare that an ex-sherry cask used for maturing sherry over a long time is actually sold on to the whiskey industry because the sherry producers, whatever style of sherry they're producing, they want a detanic, a, 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 a non-tannin cask. In other words, a well-worn cask, which is not going to impart too much wood into the flavor of the sherry because the primary purpose of the cask is to moderate and control oxidization over time, mm. not deliver the flavors out the wood. Therefore, they're, ha they're holding on to casks for hundreds, sometimes hundreds of years, wow. uh, as long as the integrity and structure is intact. So what the whiskey industry in Scotland are doing is they are basically buying seasoned casks. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a big earner for the sherry industry who get their cask wood because the best workable cask wood comes from the US, the most affordable cask wood. And of course, in European wood is not used so much because of all the bureaucracy and red tape of trying to get access to it. And of course, the cognac industry, they're using Lamazan French oak, so they've got their first shout and access to that, understandably so, because it's their indigenous French industry, and so they should. But the Spanish sherry industry, they're importing American oak, oak wood, either as casks or they're making it themselves as casks, and then they're seasoning it. In other words, they're storing um, commercial sherry and sherry syrups, because PX is a sherry syrup, in that cask for a length of time to season the cask for the Scotch whiskey industry. Um, we talked earlier about whiskey shows, and you've been to Toronto. You've been to the Spirit of Toronto. Rob and I have been there a couple of times. Um, lots of fun. Is there a whiskey show that once COVID restrictions have been lifted that you're looking forward to most to going? I know that you've been to Glasgow whiskey show. Um, the whiskey show, the fine and rare I've heard is awesome or the fine and old. I've heard there's some phenomenal pours there. Is there one that uh, is your favorite that you want to go back to as soon as you can? No. <laughs> Are you done with whiskey shows? Yes. Okay. I'm done with whiskey shows. I've enjoyed them, but I, I mean, I, I, I still go over, as and when I can travel, I will go over to a whiskey show in Scotland. And it gives me an opportunity to meet a lot of distillers in one place and get wee soundings and hear what they have to say and hear what they want to tell me. But I don't make a point of going out my way to whiskey shows. I did go to the fine and rare several times when it was in Glasgow, mm -hmm. um, it was it was more expensive. It was seventy five pounds for the ticket, and you had to pay for each tram when you got in. But it was a chance for me not to go for the high end of stuff, but to taste the low end stuff that often gets overlooked, mm -hmm. like some old blend, some rattly old blend, or some old bourbon from the nineteen forties. And I'm not doing it. It was it was useful exercise just to help me increase my points of reference in terms of palate. But it moved to London. Um, it, what didn't justify me going all the way to London, going through the hassle and uh, trying to book hotels and the cost of it in London. At the moment, I'll maybe go to one whiskey festival a year, and that's the Glasgow Whiskey Festival, because it is organised by Glasgow's Whiskey Club, and, and I was a member for a long, long time. So I do that out of lo loyalty. And the fact they invite me over as a guest and it kind of covers a few, covers a few areas to be there. As I say, to, to it's, a, it's a festival that's just before Christmas and New Year. It attracts a lot of the independent bottlers and small distilleries. So it's a perfect offer, opportunity for me to wander around the tables before the show starts and just say hello. Um, 
one more question I had for you. Um, Serge was on your channel a very long time ago uh, from Whiskey Fun. Do you keep in touch? Are you guys friends? Do you talk at all? What's your relationship like with him? No. Um, Serge is, is, is a wonderful character who has, without doubt, got the most articulate, comprehensive spirits tasting note library that's ever been created. Right. And I absolutely applaud him for that. We're very different people. We did meet as part of a, a Malt Maniacs thing many, many years ago and had a brief interview, very pleasant. And I've got a lot of time for him. I think he does a fantastic, I think it's fantastic that he perseveres um, with, you know, tasting so much over such a long uh, period of time because... I would probably get a little bit sick of it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively fortunate. I only have to really taste one particular whiskey a week that I'm going to review and that's it. Um, but he's got, um, he's got Angus McRail to help him out now, yep. which is jolly good. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's always good for a laugh going to whiskeysponge.com uh, and wondering if he's going to receive a lawyer's letter anytime soon uh, <laughs> for some of his comments. Very entertaining. And, um, but I've always really just stuck to the bothy. I've got invite. I've had inv invites over the years to different tastings, launches, festivals, and events. But I try to keep it a hobby, and I don't want to get sucked into the vortex of it all. What's the distillery to look out for? What, in your opinion, what's the next daft mill? What's the one distillery in the next, you know, five years or so that is on your radar, something that um, you see as being releasing quality malt in the next uh, few years? Wolfburn. Wolfburn. Yeah. There's one. Yeah. There's a few of the Irish distilleries. They're still finding their feet. They've been slow to get started. They've made a few mistakes, some of them, but they're learning from experience and they've got a, they've got a supportive culture around them. So I think some Irish distilleries are going to be producing some genuinely exciting whiskies um, in the in the near future. At the moment, they're relying on independent in-house independent bottlings, which they put under their own brand of Cooley. But I remember one of the first Irish whiskies that really, um, you know, floated my boat was the Cooley version bottled. One question, Ralphie, that I forgot to ask you. Uh, your very first whiskey review, uh, the Canadian whiskey, the Glen Breton 10-year-old. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that in your book. Was that something that you wanted to do first as a whiskey review, as kind of like a slight towards the Scotch Whiskey Association for trying to take the Glen out of the Glen Breton distillery? Yeah. Glen Breton appeared... Uh, at a London retailer, a London-based whiskey retailer. And I bought a bottle. It was my first bottle of Canadian single malt whiskey, mm. 10 years old. And it didn't, it get very mixed reviews, but I enjoyed it because it was different and it was honest. Mm -hmm. It was a very light whiskey. Essentially, it was quite Irish in style. You could taste the inexperience in production, but it was honestly done. And it infuriated me. It made me quite angry that the Scotch whiskey industry, the Scotch Whiskey Association, had spent so much money taking Glen Breton Distillery, the Glen, the distillery to court to try and stop them using the name Glen, right. when in fact they were in Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. 60 miles south of Inverness, on the east coast of Canada, which was the first stopping point for so many Scots who were evicted forcibly from their land during the evictions. Right during the clearances. It wasn't just the Highland clearances, Jeremy. 
it was this, there was British clearances. There was clearances in England, mm. in Scotland and Wales. There was a all over to reduce the population uh, because they wanted to use the, 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 they wanted less obstruction to the use of the land for sheep and agriculture mm. for making profit. Mm. They wanted to depopulate to basically put bodies into the colonies because force of numbers would help them get keep a, a hold of it. And of course, as much as you have troops to enforce it, you need a whole load of agricultural workers, whether they be in Canada producing rye or wheat or whatever, or happen to be down in the Caribbean producing sugarcane. Yeah. Same difference. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was and, really cool, really interesting. And Glenn Breton had every right, every cultural right to use that name Glenn. Mm. Yeah. And it was it was very hard for the distillery. It caused an awful lot of stress, stress and eventually they had to sell because of the legal costs and it shouldn't have happened. It infuriated me and that kicked off my first whiskey review. Fair enough. Um, like we do on every podcast, we always score the whiskey. Um, Ralphie, I believe you reviewed all of the ones in front of you. Rob, you've reviewed those. I have not reviewed this one yet. But Ralphie, why don't you go ahead? Is there any difference uh, in score that you would score these whiskeys now that was different from when you reviewed them? No, not at all. Um, I mean, I'm working all through all three of them, thoroughly enjoying them. Um, I spoke to Isle of Arden Distillers, actually, not that long ago, um, just to get some feedback on the feedback they'd been getting. Um, and naturally, being a business, they're not going to give you facts and figure statistics, but getting a, a general consensus malt mate type award for a standard bottling in the range which is affordable and accessible um, is, is very well appreciated by them. Uh, as a smaller distillery it certainly positively impacted their sales in the way that it simply gives a less well-known brand uh, a greater point of recognition and one that becomes indelible because it's not like a BBC documentary where, or a, a Canadian broadcasting company documentary where the, you know, the show is there and then it's gone and you're never going to see it again. What goes online, unless it's removed and deleted, is permanent. It becomes part of the timeline. And there are consultants being employed by whiskey companies who will go over this timeline. They'll see the way things are morphing because... What the points of reference in the past, they relate to the present and they can see the way things are going in the future. An online, wider, generalised community, so long as it maintains its integrity and personality and, and lady and gentlemanliness. So, so long as it had a self-respect and a dignity um, and, and doesn't just jump in to trash anything in particular, uh, just for, for, for clickbait, then um, the consultants will go back to distillers and say, you know, these guys are well worth communicating with because they have got growing and growing clout. Uh, Jeremy, what do you score your Aaron 18? So I've put a good dent in this bottle. Um, really much enjoying it. It's definitely opened up a little bit from when I first had it. Lots of notes of chocolate, uh, fruit. The finish is just pure chocolate fudge. Um, really, really rich and really delicious. Um, like salted caramel comes through a lot. Uh, the oak is nice and soft. Um, this is a very solid 88 out of 100 for me. And for value, um, 120 ish Canadian dollars cannot go wrong with that price. Bump it up a tick. Let's go 89 out of 100 for this. Yeah, I'm going to keep my. Sorry, Rafi, uh, did you want to jump in there? No, nope, you carry on, Rob. So I'm going to keep my mark. I think this is my second bottle, which is usually telling for me that I love the whiskey when I open a second. Um, 
So I'm going to keep my 90 with the 18 and I am going to score the 21 because I had some time with it tonight. And obviously I've had some time with it previous to that. Um, I'm going to go with the 90 on the 18 and I'm going to match that with a 90 on the 21. I feel like if I had to choose one, I'd still choose the 18 for price because I, I don't think the quality differs that much. But if you want more of a distillery characteristic, you should go with the 21 because the 18 is incredible sherry casks, but it it slightly masks maybe the distillery characteristic of the Aaron, whereas you're getting more of that with the 21. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for us, Ralphie. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure, a treat, and a privilege to have you on the book. Absolute uh, honor. Make sure that you guys check out this book. It's available on Amazon. You can get it. Um, pick it up. It's a nice, easy read and really interesting uh, stuff in there for sure. Yeah, it was an absolute honor. And uh, please look out for Ralphie as well on the um, Water of Life movie that's, yes. I think, out tonight. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly when this will air on both the podcast um, area of things and as well as uh, both of our YouTube channels. But uh, check out the Water of Life because Ralphie's on there as well. Oh, bless. And thank you both for inviting me onto your um, podcast. Uh, initially, when you invited me, I said no, because I was being a stick in the mud, but <laughs> primarily because I've got really poor internet signals, and I was concerned that either it would freeze up or I'd drop off because of the... I'm out in, the, I'm in a remote place. I'm out, way out in the countryside near the coast. So I get a very poor signal, but I'm really glad that it's actually worked out well. So thank you very much for being wonderful hosts. Uh, and thank you for, for, for buying my book and <laughs> allow me to mention my, my, my next book, which at the moment is still being reformatted and it needs to be a step up and a step forward. I've really enjoyed buying writing the new book. It's a fictional collection of short stories and... Um, It'll, it'll be out, out for sale in a few, hopefully about a month's time. There you go. Excellent. Have a look out for that. Thanks so much for joining us yet again, and have a good one, guys. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. now.